Hi everyone, welcome to the April edition of Wavelength. When heavy rains fell over parts of the Texas Hill Country in mid-March, Sandy Creek and the Llano River rose very quickly, causing floodgates to be opened at Wirtz and Starkey Dams. Now that's a normal springtime event here in Central Texas. What's different is, this marks the first time that the new floodgate hoists at Wirtz Dam have been used in an actual floodwater event. You recall that seven new floodgate hoists were lifted into place on top of Wirtz Dam back in November. What this means is that each of the 10 floodgates now has its own hoist permanently installed. This gives LCRA operators much more control over which gates will be opened, how far, and how fast. These hoists uh, operate uh, opening gates about a little over a foot a minute if, if it's necessary. And now, if, if we were required, we could actually open all 10 gates simultaneously, if necessary. The ability to respond more quickly to uh, the uncontrolled inflows from the Llano River and from Sandy Creek, uh, will, our operation will be much improved in those areas. Another big advantage of the new system is the ability to better control erosion downstream of the dam. Operators can now open several gates a small amount instead of having to open a single gate all the way, which sends a huge slug of water downstream all at once. These old hoists have served their purpose and they've been good and faithful servants for a long time, but we're sure glad they have some brothers to work with them right now. Dam modernization plans call for two new gate hoists to be added at Buchanan Dam and seven at Tom Miller Dam in Austin later this year. The LCRA has spent a lot of time over the past month listening to what people in the service area have to say about the Longhorn Pipeline. The pipeline, which was originally built in the 1940s to carry crude oil, may soon be carrying gasoline and other petroleum products if the owners win approval from the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Transportation. The line travels through the heart of the LCRA service area, crossing the Colorado River or its tributaries at 13 locations. The LCRA, from that standpoint, therefore, became concerned about Longhorn Pipeline last summer for several reasons. Number one, like Through a series of informal town hall meetings, the LCRA offered people in and around the cities of Junction, Fredericksburg, Johnson City, and Smithville an opportunity to study important information and to talk one-on-one -on -one with LCRA representatives about how the pipeline might affect them. These meetings are to gather input from our communities. The people that live along the pipeline, that live in the communities, they know where it is, they know what the issues are, they know what their concerns are, and what we're hoping to get is gather that in from them and provide that to the EPA and the EPA's contractor, Radian, so that that can be considered during the environmental assessment. One of the key components of the meetings was the comments section, where residents were able to talk to a court reporter who transcribed their comments on the spot. These informal meetings are just part of a larger study that is being conducted by the Environmental Protection Agency. That study will review data from LCRA as well as other sources. The EPA is expected to have a draft recommendation completed by June, and then there will be one more round of public hearings before a final decision is made on whether to allow refined petroleum products to flow through the pipeline. In GENCO news, LCRA employees in the Electric Generation Division have won first place in a national safety contest. The American Public Power Association awarded the 1998 Electric Utility Safety Award to GENCO employees for averaging less than one accident for every 200,000 hours worked. Guam Power Authority was second in LCRA's division, averaging about five accidents per 200,000 hours worked. This award represents an incredible safety commitment by the LCRA in recent years. For instance, Fayette, uh, eight, ten years ago, had 18, 20 lost time accidents in a year. So to be able to move from that kind of a record to the record that we have nowadays is really pretty remarkable and shows a lot of commitment from our employees. This safety award goes to LCRA employees at Hilby Gas Storage Facility, Smithville Rail Car Facility, as well as Sim Gideon, Ferguson, and Fayette Power Plants.
Well, the trees are going in at the Ferguson Power Plant near Marble Falls. Plant employees and local citizens are continuing the tree planting which was started last year. It's all part of Ferguson's commitment to protecting and improving the environment as part of the Clean Industries Plus program sponsored by the Texas Natural Resource Conservation Commission. This project today is actually phase two of Ferguson's Operation Greenbelt. Uh, we started last year and this is a long-term plan, more than five years, to plant trees every year, not only to help with habitat, but also to offset air emissions, of which we're all concerned about. I feel personally that it's a, a very positive thing for the area. A lot of the people that live around here, um, you know, there's a lot of noise coming from the plant and the visual is not real great. And so this will help both of those factors, the pollution factor, the visual, and, and uh, and people, I think, will be really pleased in the future by, by what it actually does. In addition to improving air quality, beautifying the view, and serving as a noise barrier, the trees also provide additional cover for the many deer that live at the power plant site. To qualify for Clean Industries Plus, Ferguson has committed to reducing carbon dioxide emissions by 59 tons per year, conserving 420,000 gallons of water per year, and to planting 385 trees over the next five years. According to plant manager Marion Nichols, without the help and support of local communities, this effort would be very difficult. The Clean Industry uh, Citizen Advisory Committee is just remarkable at, at the Ferguson plant. We have a meeting once a month. The participation is just fantastic. They come up with a lot of the ideals. They're, they're there to do the work. They're not there just to do the talking. Uh, household hazardous waste events, they're there. Uh, planting the trees, they're there. The meetings, they're there. Just about anything that they as a group decide on us doing, they participate in it. The old saying, there's strength in numbers, certainly applies to the LCRA Employees United Charities. There are currently 932 employees who each contribute 70% of one hour's salary per month. Now that's not a whole lot for the individual to give up. But as a group, United Charities distributes about $250,000 a year to deserving organizations throughout LCRA's 58 county service area, supporting everything from the Salvation Army and Family Crisis Centers to local fire departments and food pantries. Which brings us to the subject of our monthly visit with General Manager Mark Rose. This month I'd like to take a, a moment to put a plug in for United Charities and to first thank all of you for your contributions and also to thank all of the elsewhere employees who volunteer to help make United Charities the very special organization that it is. It's one of our great, great weapons uh, out there in, in the world of competition and community service. And, and it's not just the money, but it's, it's the people touch that we bring. And I think that's really uh, best described by what's going on right now with our effort to help the local food pantries. Uh, March is a month in which many of the food pantries go through their fundraising drives because there are some national match programs. So for every dollar a food pantry raises, there is a, a national match, and it makes it very significant. What we've done in United Charities is try to group some of our regional contributions so that we get the maximum bang for our buck, and the local uh, food pantries do that as well. So there'll be about twenty or thirty thousand dollars worth of contributions going out to local food pantries in March, it'll translate into say forty or fifty thousand dollars. That that's very significant. Plus it just puts a, a focus on a very serious issue and that you know there really shouldn't be anybody in Texas that goes hungry. There shouldn't be anybody in this country uh, that goes hungry. And uh, it's just great that United Charities is as active as it is and that it represents LCRA as well as it does. Thank you very much for your contribution. And if you're not a member, join. Solar power from the sun, hydropower from moving water, and wind power. These are the primary sources of non-polluting renewable energy. With its six hydroelectric dams and ongoing purchase of wind power from West Texas, the LCRA is the largest supplier of renewable energy in the state. Now the LCRA Board of Directors has authorized the purchase of an additional 22 megawatts of wind energy. 
The power will come from the Delaware Mountain Wind Farm, a new project being developed in Culberson County by American National Wind Power. Construction has started on the first 30 megawatt phase of what is proposed to be a 250 megawatt project. Wind power, of course, has been around for eons, and people have used it you know, for thousands of years. But what's happening is, as technology is evolving, as personal uh, computers get smaller and faster and more, more powerful, that's sort of bringing wind power along with it. It's becoming more efficient. It's becoming less costly. It's becoming more available. And it's the fastest growing resource of any type in the world last year, calendar 98. The LCRA currently buys all of the power from the 35 megawatt wind plant called the Texas Wind Power Project, also in Culberson County. Existing transmission lines are used to transfer the power from the wind plant to the LCRA service area. It has served as a link between Mills and San Saba counties since 1939. Spanning the Colorado River, the Regency Bridge has connected farmers and ranchers to their markets, joined families together, and it has served as a gathering place for decades. Today, it stands as one of the last remaining suspension bridges in Texas. Now on the 60th anniversary of its completion, hundreds of people gathered on the banks of the Colorado River to rededicate the newly restored bridge. We've been showing you this bridge on our TV Texas Country reporter Bob Phillips served as master of ceremonies. Governor George W. Bush attended the event and paid tribute to this symbol of Texas strength and unity. This is a bridge that means a lot to Mills County and San Saba County. It also means a lot symbolically to making sure we never forget the greatness of Texas. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank the historical commissions who have made sure this bridge was uh, modernized. I want to thank uh, Bob for helping promote one of the cleanest industries there is in Texas, which is tourism. San Saba County Judge Harlan Barker and Mills County Judge Randy Wright signed a proclamation recognizing March 1st, 1999 as Regency Bridge Day. We'll also still be seeing the damage from last October's deadly floods. The high water killed 31 people, damaged top three quarters of a billion dollars. Now a report is out showing us what forecasters did right and wrong while people scrambled for higher ground. KB24 Shelley Fisher joins us live now from the Guadalupe River in New Braunfels. Hey Shelley, I remember that raging water was right behind you then. Oh, Walt, check out what the water left behind still here six months later. This is the frame of a trailer. You can see the, the hitch is still in the ground, but look how the water just totally twisted that frame. It's amazing, really. Behind me looks like a bus converted into a mobile home, absolutely cracked in half. A lot of the question now is, could any of this devastation have been avoided? Well, the answer is, weather is never an exact science. According to a federal report, the National Weather Service and the Lower Colorado River Authority gave people almost an hour's notice before the floods hit. We did our job and we did it very well. But the question is, could it have been done even better? So I think we would have had a better handle on this, on the magnitude of this flood situation had there been better upper air monitoring network in place. Along the southern border of Texas, there are three upper air monitoring stations, one in Brownsville, Del Rio, and Corpus Christi. These stations send up weather balloons twice a day to measure weather conditions. The problem is the large holes in between the stations leave much of Texas unmonitored. It's argued those holes let a major storm slip through and the rains arrived 12 hours earlier than predicted. We're going to put a meteorologist every half mile, for example, or an upper air station every 50 miles. There's a, there's a point where your costs do not uh, give you any more results. So. National Weather Service people say their computers can only process so much data. Any more weather information coming in, and a computer would take days rather than hours to produce a forecast. But would we have had better warning? Would less have been lost? Would we have had the complete answer? It's, it's pure speculation. We don't know. There was another question of incorrect flood crests. Well, at one time, the water was raging so quickly down the Guadalupe that it buried 18 river gauges. At that point, there was no more information to give all those folks downstream. Walt? 
And so-called people pollution on Lake Travis is another concern tonight. A population explosion on the lake is putting more boats and people on the water. And tonight, the Lower Colorado River Authority is concerned about safety, especially as we head into summer. KV24's Kim Barnes is live at Lake Travis tonight. What is the LCRA doing, Kim? Well, trying to figure out what to do about all the traffic on Lake Travis. To start with, there is a huge demand for places to park boats. Most marinas in the area, like this one, are full with waiting lists. There are plans to build several more in this area, though, and around Lake Travis. That could bring the total to more than 5,000 boat stalls on the lake. Because of easy access to boat ramps and lots of private docks, the LCRA says on some days there are just too many boats and people on the water. One option could be a daytime speed limit or perhaps preventing certain kinds of watercraft on certain days on certain parts of the lake. Over the next couple of years, we're going to have to go to uh, a more stringent form of regulation of use on the lake, or we're going to have some real problems. Now, they also plan to probably look at the number of boat stalls that are allowed on the lake, but any new regulations are not going to come quickly. These, at, at this point, even are, aren't even recommendations. They are still just ideas. The LCRA wants to get lots of input first. Well, a very popular lake, and like it or not, Lake Travis leads the list of Texas lakes with the most boating accidents reported. Judy? It's also critical for Texas to make sure we're ready for worst-case flooding. Tonight, KV24's Olga Campos looks at what's being done to make sure we are. 64 years ago, a flood left downtown Austin underwater. Further upstream, the dam crumbled under the force of raging waters from the Colorado River. Today, Tom Miller Dam stands where two others failed to hold back water in the past. Wes Birdwell of the Lower Colorado River Authority says Miller is in good shape thanks to bigger dams upstream like Mansfield. There really are public safety issues. That's, that's why we waited till last year. Instead, LCRA's priority for repairs and $25 million went to Wirtz Dam near Lake LBJ, while $14 million is being spent to upgrade other dams, including Inks and Buchanan. On Miller Dam's turn, $13 million will be spent to make it strong enough to handle the worst possible conditions. By state law, that's more than 30 inches of rain in six hours. The dam it would, would be under more stress than it was designed to handle in that situation. Parts of it would wash away, parts of it may slide and move downstream. The LCRA says at worst there would be little damage downstream, but it still plans to reinforce the existing structure. Work would be limited to the downstream side of the dam, causing little disruption along Lake Austin, all at no expense to taxpayers. At LCRA sells electricity and sells water, and it's coming, uh, this project to be paid for strictly from those sources. Olga Campos, KV24 News. The first step to fixing Tom Miller Dam is for the LCRA to approve about a half million dollars to cover engineering design costs. At the earliest, it will be about two years before you see construction work going on out there. We leave you this time with the sights and sounds of the Travis County Livestock Show and Rodeo. The LCRA and Arrowhead Film and Video were both sponsors of this year's show, and many LCRA employees were among the 800 volunteers that helped make this event possible. In the last two years, more than $2 million has been awarded to Travis County students through scholarships, auction receipts, and prize money. Next year, the Livestock Show will become a regional event, including students from Bastrop, Burnett, Caldwell, Hayes, Lee, and Williamson counties. Well, that's it for this edition of Wavelength. We'll look forward to seeing you again next time.